ask you, if you would, this morning, open to Psalm 16. Psalm 16, and as, ha- as has been mentioned, we're going to talk about joy today. Uh, but I, I want to start that conversation with a statement about those moments when you don't exactly feel joy. We're going to talk today about what it means for our joy to be in Christ. It is likely that if you're a believer, you've heard similar statements. Joy is an expression of our faith. And what comes with that is this, when, when our joy is attacked, when the strength of the sun is blocked by clouds, proverbially in our lives, there can be this compounding problem of guilt. And I say compounding for this, whatever it is that is muting or or robbing or reducing our joy is in and of itself a weight. And then we look at the Christian expectation, no, have joy in Christ, don't worry about the circumstances, have joy in Christ, joy is an expression of faith and all those kinds of things. And then we feel guilty about not having more joy. And so now we have the weight of whatever it is that earthly circumstance is, compounded by guilt that we're not joyful through it, and it just becomes this thing that spirals out of control unnecessarily. And so I want to start by saying what we're going to talk about today is a trajectory for life that will be disrupted in seasons. And if you are in a season where your heart is heavy because of a circumstance, I am not telling you not to be joyful. I am telling you that it's okay to mourn. It's okay to, in that moment, feel the weight of the world. And to understand that our joy, our happiness can be disrupted. But as a whole, as a way of living, joy is something that God has equipped us for. I want to read to you Psalm 16, and then after we're finished with that, we'll, we'll go through more carefully. But it reads like this, Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrow of those who run after another God shall multiply their drink offerings of blood. I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad. And my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. Or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. We've talked about this a couple of times. I like to do Advent a little bit differently, maybe, than some would. And I want to show you inside of Psalm 16 a bit of a 
of reasoning for why we do the order the way that we do it here. He starts off saying, God preserve me. When he says, God preserve me and, and I take refuge in you, what he is saying is this, the world around me is at war against me. You do not on your average day think, God keep me because I have to hide in you. And these are things that we, we tend to write on heavy days and heavy moments, but it's something that David acknowledges throughout. But David here is talking about needing the Lord to preserve him, taking refuge in him. You know what David is talking about here? His hope. David places his hope in the Lord. Things come against him, and he doesn't say, well, I'll tough it out. He says, Lord, preserve me. I take refuge in you. You are my sanctuary. You are my safe place. When I need protection, I seek it from the Lord. I am come to you for that. Why? Because you are my hope. And then he hammers that nail over and over again. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. And apart from you, there's no good. There is nothing good apart from him. Why? Because he is my hope. The saints of the land, those who also hope in him, I see as a good thing. But there are those who place their hope in an other God, in other things. And he says, I will not participate in them who have, with them who have a misplaced hope. Why? In verse 5 and 6, he reminds us again, because my hope is in you and what you have established for me. Verses 1 through 6 tell us that David's hope is in the Lord. And then in verse 7 and 8, he says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. Also, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Verse, the, the first part of verse 8 and verse 7 there are still on the idea of Hope, I have placed the Lord before me. I have set him before me. He is my hope. And because of that, I am not shaken. Because the Lord is my hope, I am at peace. You see that word because there is going to link the two. And so the Lord is both his hope and his peace, his hope, and his peace. Verse 9 begins with, therefore. This is significant, because today we're going to not talk about hope and peace. That was something we talked about the last two Sundays. Today, we're going to talk about joy, but we cannot have a conversation about biblical Christian joy unless we understand the foundation of hope and peace in God. Do not shortcut the process. Too often times what we want to do is we just want to jump straight to joy. We say, God, I don't like the feeling that I have. I want a different feeling. And so God, bring me that feeling. Bring me that emotion. I don't want to deal with this. And although joy is available to us, it is available to us on a foundation. That's why David says, therefore before he starts talking about joy. Based on the fact that I have placed my hope in the Lord and from that have received peace in the Lord, the equation adds up that I can have joy. 
joy apart from hope is asking to be numbed in the moment from reality. Joy apart from peace is asking for an umbrella in the storm. But when you see these things as compounding issues, and we will year after year bring ourselves back to the idea that these things are compounding issues. When you see them as compounding and you find yourself outside of joy, then you can look back and you say, okay, where am I placing my hope? Am I placing my hope in a temporary thing? Is my hope in something circumstantial? Maybe that's why I don't have joy. Is it an issue of anxiety that I'm not resting in the peace of the promise of my God? David lines them up as compounding things. A hope in God. Because of that hope, we have peace. Therefore, my heart is glad. And my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I want to, I want to talk to two people today about joy. The first person that I want to talk to is the person who does not allow themselves joy. And for some of you, that might seem a strange thing. In the world in general, there are people who struggle with the idea of joy. I think it is an unfortunate, com- an unfortunate concentration of people that struggle with the idea of allowing themselves joy are Christians. Because we've been made to feel guilty about enjoying life. That somehow being miserable and not enjoying life is an expression of piety. Now, to be fair, it is clear that God Himself is our ultimate joy. But I hope to show you in this that he is not our only thing to enjoy. When we think about the idea of giving gifts, it's not a foreign concept to talk about God as a father giving gifts, right? Jesus does it a couple of times in the New Testament. He says, you guys know how to give good gifts. How much more your father? The ultimate gift that God has given us is the gift of Christ for our salvation that we might have presence and relationship with him. But that's not our only gift. That's not the only gift that God would give us. In fact, if we, if we look here at the passage, the way, the way that it wraps up, he says, the, he says, in your presence, there is the fullness of joy. What is the fullness of joy? It is the presence of the Lord. At your right hand, are pleasures forevermore. Verse 9, my heart is glad. My heart is glad. But you know what else is glad? His flesh dwells secure. And then he doubles down on that right in between by saying the whole being rejoices the heart, and the flesh.
when we give gifts, the nature of giving a gift is that it is a relational expression, right? I thought of you and I wanted to give you this. Or I know that you have need and I want you to know that I care, so I am meeting that need. Regardless, it is a relational statement to give a gift. The same is true for God. All gifts that he gives are relational statements. Now, there's a right and a wrong way to receive a gift, isn't there? We, we could all imagine what it would look like for, and, and, and maybe not even imagine, maybe, maybe this is something that you've experienced, but for a child to receive a gift, have nothing to do with the giver, and say this this is all I want. And whatever relational statement is being made, I don't care. I want the thing. If your children receive a gift from a grandparent, what do you do? You give the elbow under the table, say, thank you. Right? Because we want them to appreciate the giver. This is important. This is how we receive the gifts that God has given to us. We do not need to put them above the giver because they are not above the giver. They are a token expression of his relationship to us. This is what goes wrong in Romans chapter 1, right? He talks about those who worship the creature over the creator. We don't worship the gift over its giver. But at the same time, when I give a gift to my kids, I don't want them to say, no, dad, no. No, that is a temptation and a problem. It's a distraction. Get rid of it. I only want to focus on you. What do you want in that situation? Just, just for a moment, take the headiness out of it and just put it on simple terms. What do you want in that situation? What's the ideal? The ideal is that they would love the gift and love the giver. That they would enjoy the gift and appreciate the relational statement that it makes. God has given us ultimate gift in the gospel, but he has given us other gifts. You might need to release yourself to enjoy life, to enjoy the gifts that life brings, the simple things without guilt and recognize when God created this world he created it as good he thought it was good he enjoyed it and as an ultimate expression of that he created man and woman in his own image to enjoy it with him and to have dominion over it with him. But for some reason, we in the church have taken the pleasures of this life and we've marked them as bad or dangerous. And if that is not the case, we have decided that we would say, in some instances, no, I am 
nearer to God and nearer to the heart of God in that I don't enjoy the gifts he has given me. And it doesn't add up. It doesn't work. If that's you, I just want to say, life is full of simple gifts, tokens of relationship from God. Not always large things, although sometimes it can be. Sometimes small things. And it is no wasted expression of worship for you to have joy, to release yourself to enjoy the things in life that God has given you. Now, I say we've gone wrong because why? Well, I, I know the answer to that. The answer to that is because things can go wrong, right? And there, there might be, there might be, two visceral reactions going on right now. There might be some that are like, hey, pastor said go for it. And so I'm going for it. This, this is the sermon I've been waiting on my whole life. And there's also some of you that are sitting there just quaking in your seat going, true or not, you can't say it because what if? What if that leads to well, here's the thing. There is nothing inside of what has been said this morning that allows people to enjoy sin. When you read 16, Psalm 16 talks about being in the Lord and of the Lord through the whole thing. So if you want to take and apply this to something outside of the Lord, you are saying something that I have not said. In fact, I would go one further and I would say that verses four and, uh, verse four, sorry, is all about saying, I am not going to put my hope or find my joy in things that are false, particularly here in false gods. So if you take this to mean, hey, this is license to sin, this is Christian anarchy as sanctioned by the pastor, then what you are doing is you're justifying something that you wanted to hear and not hearing what I'm saying. I'm saying this. God's created world is an expression of himself for his glory. And when we receive those expressions with joy, we are, we are receiving expressions of Him and appreciating those expressions of Him. Is that too much weight to put on a cookie and a cup of tea in the afternoon? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think these little joys are the sort of token things that we do for one another as an expression of relationship. And so I think we should enjoy them so long as we're enjoying them in Him. So now we have potentially some conflicting ideas. On one hand, we say it is okay to have pleasures of the flesh, pleasures rooted temporally in this world because they are gifts from God to be appreciated. And at the same time, we're saying, be careful because the things of this world can lead us astray. I need a practical measure. I need a way to mark a rule and say, this is how I determine which is which and how far is too far. I agree, so let me explain that to you. If this world was created for us to enjoy as an expression of the glory of God, 
yet was broken by sin. And when it was broken by sin, the fall comes. I would say you just need to ask the question about the thing that you're finding joy in. Is this a result of the fall or a result of the creation and the glory of God? In some instances, things are going to feel neutral. You may look at it and be like, my cookie and cup of tea kind of thing, right? Is this particularly an act of worship? Well, no. Does, does that exist because of the fall? Well, no. Receive it in joy as a token, a pleasure. God designed us to have the capacity for pleasure and to enjoy this life. Ultimately, Him as the fullness of joy, but also the pleasures at His right hand. And so long as you can look at something and you can say, no, this, this thing that I am enjoying, am enjoying is not in and of itself sinful, then enjoy. And as long as you looked at something, and this happens so often, people are like, well, I, I feel like I like it too much. This is what too much means. It matters more to me than God itself and therefore has been idolized. And I am worshiping the gift over the giver. That is the mark for too far. If you are short of that, enjoy. Because God has given you capacities to enjoy this world. So do that. You know, we, when we're children, we can't wait to grow up, right? So that we can do all the stuff that grown-ups do. No one telling me what to do. I can go where I want to go. I can stay up as late as I want. But as an adult, have you ever looked at the joy of a child with envy? And thought, man, to be so carefree, wouldn't you love to have that? That's, that's why children are so much better at expressing joy than we are, because they just have this unhindered, unweighted outlook on life. One of the reasons why a child can have that is because the heavy things of life that are out of their control are, in, a, in the best of scenarios, handled for them by a parent, guardian who loves them, is providing for them. And on top of that, on top of just meeting their their basic needs for life. They are being loved in a variety of ways, big and small. We do this for our kids. I don't mean to brag, but we keep the heat turned on in the house. We make sure that meals are eaten and their basic needs are met. But you know what else I like to do? Sometimes I like to just drop in the chocolate something just to see the smile. And if I'm a sinning father, how much more so does my heavenly father know how to give good gifts? Ultimately, his presence. But so many things in addition to that. And I just want to tell you, I just want to tell you, I, yes, one of the people that we're talking to here is a, a people who choose to find their joy outside of the things of God, who are believers choosing to find their joy in sin. There's no joy to be had there. But I think the weight of the message, the more common thing for us 
today in the church are the children of God who just have lost that childlike joy. It places hope and peace in the hands of a father and is willing to say, I'm going to enjoy life. I'm going to receive this, recognize it as a special token from God. And I want to encourage you. I want to encourage us. We don't, we don't have to be somber as our main emotion. It's not more pious for us to be a rejecting culture, rejecting all the things around us, but to be a people who are lighthearted because our hope is in someone who transcends our circumstance and to be a people who receive in joy all of the gifts that God has given to us. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for all of the ways you've loved me. God, big and small. God, I pray that on the foundation of what you have already done, God, you would open my eyes again to the simple pleasures. God, so many things that... I've unlearned to enjoy. God, and I pray that with childlike eyes, childlike receptivity, you would teach us as a people to enjoy every aspect of life, big or small. God, not to fear the way that you've reached out to us in love. Not to run from it because we feel that maybe it makes you happy or makes us better. But God, to enjoy. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and let's sing.